welcome everybody bala santosha we have in our midst uh, uh, my friend uday kumar uh, and avaru helo hage accidental historian conservationist bari history study madodalla estro estro history estro historical uh, small elements nashis hogta ide adanna active work conserve maartakkantavaru and uh, somebody who takes a uh, a uh, fantastic interest in uh, bangalore and its history in fact ningellarigu nenpirbodu the last couple of talks bere circles alli map out kuda organize madidru both those speakers refer to uday and thank to uday so uh, i'm happy that uday has agreed to uh, speak to all of us and uh, once again uh, all of uh, all my friends from kormangla welcome uh, a warm welcome thanks for joining uh, i know a lot of work happening people are extra busy these days uh, working from home but thanks for joining and uh, so the objective of today is to look at koramangala's history and obviously that will, that is meshed with uh, bangalore history so erdu no erdu no we will leave it to the able hands of uh, mr uday uday over to you sir yep. <clears throat> so thank you so much uh... and thank you for the opportunity it's uh, not so much that you know you i am doing you anything you know i am so happy that you given me the opportunity so um, yeah um let me do the screen share and get started okay so what we'll do is um, you know we'll mute everybody uh, during this um, yeah and um, you know the um, just so that there's no cross talk and uh, everyone's audible to everyone else so um while um, you know badri referred to me as uday kumar i'm actually here representing a group called the inscription stones of bangalore so we are a informal group a small group of uh, volunteers uh, who um, are fascinated by the story of the city that's told in inscription stones Uh, which is quite different from what we often hear and that's the story that i would like to share with you uh, before i start a few points um, just to you know clarify how would be going if you are on a phone or a tablet it's best that you switch to the landscape mode that is turn it south by side by side a lot of these slides are best viewed in as big a format as you can if you're on a laptop or if you're on a pc that's fine and muting the phone uh, muting the mic switching off notifications please do that We'd like to be as audible as possible to everyone and video um, not necessary for you to switch off switch on your video uh, it's consuming bandwidth as well as be a distraction so please switch off your video from your sites and the question and answers uh, this format doesn't uh, not encourage a very interactive mode so we'll um, hold all the questions uh, to the very end of the you know, talk i expect this to be about 45 to 50 talk oh yeah i expect this to be a 45 to 50 minutes talk and i will follow up with questions later but you can definitely chat through the chat window send your questions over we'll take it up one by one and answer them it's open ended i don't have a cut off time i'll be happy to stay as long as anyone's interested here but you are most welcome to drop off if you have other things to do um this talk is going to be largely in english language um because i don't know the audience here and um, it's quite possible there are all kinds of people joining uh, not just people who know kannada i will intersperse it to the little bit of kannada and a little bit of tamil words as well uh, those are required to understand the story of this city okay and um, so with these uh, things in mind so let's get started um so what we are going to be talking about today is largely uh, you know the story of kormangla and uh, the moment we say kormangla almost everyone um who's been here for a while um thinks about uh, the bda shopping complex there and uh, that's uh, the first or some of the older images in this of kormangla region and what we will do today is not talk so much about this building uh, but i'll talk about the area which is about 3 kilometers spread out with this building as the center 
And what you're seeing on the screen there is um, um, the map of Bangalore and the various boundaries that you're seeing highlighted there are actually the wards of the city. So these are the, you know, this is how the administrative units of uh, Bangalore are today organized. You can also see the cross mark in the middle and that's the BDA complex and the three kilometer circle around it. So I'll be talking about um, you know, most of the things that are within this uh, boundary, especially four wards or five wards here. I'll talk about the Kormangla ward, which is number 5151. Ejipura, Jaksandra, BTM, and HSR. So in these areas, there is these are historic wards in some sense. There's, a, there's a, easily a million year story to these places. And that's what I would like you to hear today. OK. Now, let's start with something which is a little to the east. And uh, for non-Kormangla residents, this is not a name which is very familiar. Uh, Srinivagilu, 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 various, you know, various times, various people have called it in different ways. If you have traveled by bus, if you are a BTS commuter, then ST bed is a bus stop that you're quite familiar with. The S in the ST is Srinivagilu tank bed. And that's really um, not something which is so far away. Um, it's at the boundary of uh, Kormangla, Ejipura, there. Uh, what we will do is uh, we'll travel a small distance from the BDA shopping complex. So what I'm showing you here is a route map from the BDA shopping complex to a place in uh, Srinivagilu. Uh, by road, it's about 2.7 kilometers. By line of sight, it's about 1.9 kilometers. So in that region, there is something out there which is the, you know, the oldest evidence of human habitation in a very formalized manner, in a civilized manner, uh, you know, in the proximity of Kormangla today. And what is out there is this. So I'll go back for a second. The place we are going to be going to is if you see my cursor, I'm circling around a region there. So this is inner ring road. You take the inner ring road towards Domlur. And um, you know where the army, uh, the military areas start, you take a right towards that and you go inside the military camp into a place deep inside, which is where there is a Shiva temple over there. While this is all military area, public are allowed into this temple. That's a Shiva temple. And in the temple is a sculpture like this. This sculpture is called a Viragalu. It's kind of faded and worn out. This fo these photos are all taken from about a year ago when uh, you know me, who's here, and Renuka Prasad, a friend of mine, had visited there to check out what is over here. Now, this stone is actually called a Viragalu or a memorial stone or a hero stone. Veera is a hero, Kalu is a stone. It's a, it's a memorial stone erected, commissioned for, in, uh, for somebody who has performed a heroic deed. And the heroic deed is, is it could be many things. It could be martyrdom. It could be, um, you know, he's um, committed an act which is so significant that the king of the time considered it worthwhile to have his memory, you know, in, uh, in his memory, a, a stone, a carving commission. It could have been that, you know, the enemy had attacked a you know, place and this man died defending it. It could have been that there was a bunch of thieves who had come over and who were raiding the place for cattle, for women, or whatever. And, you know, the hero stone was commissioned for that purpose. Often these hero stones are. Uh, you know, just bare sculptures. There's not much information that is deducible in the sense who is, what is the hero's name, what was his, you know, why, when did it happen, and all of this information. But many hero stones also have something written on them. And that writing is called what? An uh, inscription. So it is writing on the stone. And over here in the stone, 
in this part of it, it's weathered out. You cannot see it in the photograph, but there are Kannada characters that have been written over here. And what you're seeing here is something called an STAM page, which is a print, an imprint of what is written here on paper. So here you can see some of the characters that have been written out here. Now, this is from around 750 AD, a midpoint or the 8th century. That is, this is somewhere between 700 and 800 AD. So think about it. This is about 1200 to 1300 years old. This is, you know, writing which is amongst the oldest in the city. Oldest anywhere, in fact, if you think about in the country on stone. So this is the writing. And what you're seeing here is actually Kannada. This is a Purva Kannada. There are like Kannada is categorized into, you know, three, four, uh, based on the periods, you call it as Purva Kannada, which is, you know, eighth century or before, Hale Kannada, which is about eight to 10th century or, you know, beyond, then Madhya Kannada and, you know, modern Kannada, depending on the periods. So this is older than the old Kannada, if you want to think about. And here is what is written in modern Kannada language. And this is the transcription in English for you to read it if you don't understand Kannada. Some of the characters are actually matching. You can re-identify this. The photograph's not too good, so you can't. But in later inscriptions, you'll be able to see it better. What it says is extremely you know, interesting. Look at it, read, try and read this. I'll read it aloud for you. It says, Swasti Sri Pelch Tere Yamma Siya Nil Vagila Turu Vinak Ikisi Sattu Sagyadam. Swasti Sri Pelch Tere Yamma Siya Nil Vagila. And this is the critical word that you, know, you need to focus on. CNL Vagila is modern day Srini Vagilu. What exactly it meant is also very easily understandable. CNL Vagila. Sia is Sihi or sweet. Nel is paddy, you know, rice. Vagilu is, you know, gate, village, wool Vagilu, whatever it is. So the place where sweet paddy sweet rice was growing, was grown. In that place, a person by name, Pelch Tereyamma, Pelch is, we'll come to that, Pelch Te is actually in Canada also, it's called shining or bright. And Yereyamma is the name of the place. Yamma today is essentially you know, female or mother. But Yamma Yamman is in Haleganada was actually father or male. So this place, this man called Yereyamma, the shining man Yereyamma, who was in CNL Vagilu, Tiru Nikkisi, Tiru is cows. Somebody came to steal the cows there. He got it back. And in the process, Sattu Sagi Adam. In this, he, Sattu is dead, died. Sagi is he went to Swarga. That is for this one. So basically, this inscription is a commemorative stone for a person called um, okay, um, Yereyama of CNL Vagilu. And he was a martyr of that time. And the king or the chieftain of the place thought it thought, thought that act was so worthwhile that he commissioned this sculpture. Now, here's something. The next time you pass by there. Think about this. Srini Vagilu was around in the 8th century AD. It's a fairly low income group to do you know, uh, uh, area today. We don't think twice. We don't glass, gla you know, glance even much at it. But that's how old the region of Kormangla is. We continue to use the name for after 1300 years with a small variation. Srinel Vagilu has become Srini Vagilu, Srini Vagilu, Srini Vagilu, whatever. That's the morphing that has happened over time. So next time someone asks from, you know, uh, Kormangla, how old is this? What is, you know, what, what do you think about it? Think about this. The answer is not 30 years, 40 years, whatever. Srini Vagilu in the backyard of Kormangla, you know, within walking distance there is that old. 
So this is the typical story of um, the city of any place. Inscriptions of this uh, type are essentially what are giving us information about the past. This particular inscription is telling about Srinivagilam. Also think about this. If the places had, they were growing paddy there, there must have been a water source, right? So this S T, the T in S T, where is the lake, where is the tank? This also is an indication of how old that tank is. The Srinivagilu tank, if it were around today, would have been 1300 years old. So where is that tank today? Just behind the BDA office is a park. Some of you, you know, probably know this park that you may use it. It's called the Veer Yoda Park. Yeah, that's okay. Great. Now, that's one lake. We'll come to that in a while. And where I'm showing the cursor, this is where the Srinivagilu Lake was. Bang, you know, where the ST bed, you know, there's a road which goes Srinivagilu Road as well there. It's completely built up now. How do we know this lake was there? Old maps. So if you, if you have old maps of Srinivagilu, which are from 1905, which shows you that lake. So ST tank bed is where, you know, they were growing paddy. In fact, the uh, paddy that was grown there, a lot of old timers in the region will still remember it. It's called Sihinel, right? Sweet rice. So there were many varieties. There was a variety, there was a variety called Dodda Bayra, Pedda Bayra, which they were growing even as recently as the 70s or the 80s, which is very uh, sweet. Interestingly, it's also a low water, um, and it requires very little water. These are all rain-fed lakes, so they tend to dry out. Water supply is not indefinite. So uh, Srinivagilu, the name itself is representative of the lake, number one, the place, and a type of rice as well, which was may not have been the same rice that you know, dot uh, may not have been the rice they grow in uh, 30, you know, 1300 years ago. But at least the tradition of growing a sweet variety of rice had continued until very recently there. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about Srinivagilu. Then we move on a little distant away, but we'll come back to Kormangla from there. And this is Begur. Um, a little beyond Silk Board, and if you take the first ride there, uh, uh, use an alternate road to Siltronic City is via Begur. Okay, and in Begur is this magnificent temple. This is probably the oldest and the oldest intact temple, I would say, in southern India itself. This is a Ganga period temple. This was built around nine, portions of this were built around 980. And what we are seeing here uh, called the Nageshwara, Nagareshwara, Choleshwara temple, more popularly named as the Begur Panchalingeshwara temples. So the style itself is a Ganga period structure. And over here, we had this magnificent Viragalu, another one. This is a photograph of that Virgalu and it was in the Begur temple. Today it's now in the Bangalore Museum on Kasturbaru. This photograph is from 1865 by a very famous photographer of the time by name Henry Dixon. It's an extraordinary photograph. In this you can see um, you know, the writing very clearly. You, know, you can see the carving and the writing very, very beautifully. Very elaborate. It's probably one of the most intricate Virgalus um, anywhere. Virgalus are not very, very you know, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, and all that. Unlike, say, a temple or carvings in a temple, this one is because it symbolizes a big event of those days. And what you're seeing here, and I please follow my cursor there, is a man on an elephant here and a person on a horse here. So these two people seem to be uh, fighting with each other. Obviously, if they're sitting on a horse and an elephant, the rest of the people are either standing or something, you know, they, you, this indicates that these are of some royal descent, the royalty. And the whole bunch of shows, you know, soldiers here uh, who are fighting, 
or who are dead. You can see the fighting poses here. You know, some, some of the people here are headless. Somebody has been pierced. Somebody has, you know, there's, a, there's a crow eating off uh, somebody's uh, body somewhere, picking up the body there, and all of that. A whole lot of bodies at the bottom. And then the people fighting over here at the lower level. And there's these two people who are royalty fighting with each other. And then at the top is a slight, very different scenario. Some person is seated nice, he's squatting, is seated nicely on a, on a stool. And the women here who appear to be dancers on the top. There's a typical structure of a Viragalu uh, where in a fighting scene, somebody has died and that death is a glorious death. And that's depicted in as a scene from heaven. So this person has died and this is a scene in heaven where the Apsaras are there serving him and he is being entertained. So this is the visual um, you know, information you can, this is the information you can gather from the depiction of the sculpture itself here. Just by this, you cannot know who is the person, you know, what, what's the name of uh, this person, why were they fighting, who are the, who are the enemy and all of that. However, over here is the complete narration of that in Kannada of the time. This has been dated to be from around 980. So what you're seeing here is 980 Kannada. Okay. Now there's some very important uh, inferences possible from what is written here. And what is written here has been also kind of put up in a modern thing for you. It's been translated, transcribed for you for easier reading. So this is the ancient Kannada characters. These are the modern day Kannada characters. It's possible to read this 100% clearly. Uh, this, this, uh, this, this particular graphic has been provided by Sajyota Bhatta, um, who is an epigraphist, very skilled at doing these things. Okay, I won't go through this uh, word by word. That will be that will take a long time. However, there are some very important things on written on there, which you know, which very directly relate to Kormangla and the region. So these are highlighted here. You know, the, these few words that are highlighted here. Some of you, if you can, if you're on a big screen, should be able to read these a little bit at least. The first one is Bempur. Can you read? I hope you can read that. Okay, this, um, this is Tovagur. Then this is Puvina Pulimangala, okay, so on and so forth. So there are, have a, these are the names of 10 places. Actually, there's 12. Uh, there's, I left out two here. Names of 12 places. So what is written here is very simply in plain English. It says, I'll go back for a second to this one. This one, this man here on a horse is a Ganga princess. His name is, you know, he, he is a Ganga prince. This man fighting here, his name is Nagatara. And this is a Rashtrakuta uh, attacker. And this war happened in a place called Tumbe Padi, okay, which is uh, not so far away, about 70 kilometers from Bangalore. In the Tumbe Padi battle, this elephant with the tusk pierced him and he died. And when he died, this is the chieftain of Begur, Bempur, as it was you know, as written there. When this man died, it was such an honorary death that a successor was appointed who was a friend or relative or son of this man and in return about 12 villages were granted to his successor and what is written here is that you know in plain in old Canada. so the, the in english it basically says you know when erepasa was ruling with all the you know uh, flurry uh, you know attribute uh, things attributed to him etc 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 he was ruling over Gangawadi 96,000. So this was the country of the time. Which country did Kormangla belong to in 980? It was a country by name Gangawadi. Gangawadi spanned about half of modern day Karnataka, the southern part, about Tamil Nadu right up to Coimbatore, and uh, portions of Tamil Nadu almost till Kanchipuram, and some portions of Andhra Pradesh. So this was the area that was called Ganga Wadi there. Ganga because it, the Gangas were the kings and Wadi is the country there. 96,000 essentially means it was supposed to have you know, been 96,000 villages uh, that constituted this. At that time, 
there was somebody called Veera Mahindra who attacked him. And in for uh, for that, um, a Nagatara was deputed by Ereppa Arasa to fight him, and he died in the Tumbe Party battle. In appreciation of Nagatara's valor, these 12 villages called Bempur 12, which is Bempuru, Tovaguru, Puvina, Pulimangala, blocking here, okay. Uh, Kuttai Nadu Nalluru, Nalluru, Komarangudu, Igaluru, Dogmanarili, Galanjavalli, Gal, Elkunte, and so on so forth. And last one was Pudal. These 12 villages were gifted to his successor. Let's think about this. Can you identify these places today? Yes, you can. Not so hard. Bempuru is Beguru. Toguru is Toguru. Ulimangala, which we know that as well. Komarangudu. This is the critical part, and I'm sure a lot of people showed up to hear about this, is modern day Koramangala. Komaran Gundu. Okay. Igluru is Igluru. Elkunte is deep within HL, uh, HSR layout, still Elkunte there. Kudalu. All of these names are, you know, it's a slight variation. You'll be able to recognize these places. What does that mean? It means these places were around. 1200 years ago, the place that you call Komaran Gundu here essentially is Kormangla. And if I plot it on a map, this is provided by Dr. P. V. Krishnamurti, who is an epigraphist, very noted person. So, uh, this is in Canada, this is the Bempuru 12, as it's been identified by him. Um, just at the top, northernmost part, we have Komaran Gundu, which is Kormangla, which we identified. So Galinjawal is not identified. We don't know where it is. So don't take it as an exact uh, this one. These are all our places around there. Madiwala and Agra were there. Taurakere is obviously there. Then Saraki is there and that's called as Saramu in the uh, you know, in this inscription here. Okay. So Yalkunte, we obviously saw Kudlu is over there. Bempuru is an Begur that we are talking about. Toguru is Dr. Toguru today. Puvina Mangla and all of these. So every single place now has been around at least for 1200 years in that sense. So the question is, how did you know Komaran Gundu become Koramangala? So what does it mean? Um, the two or three alternate theories for this. Um, the first of which is, this is Kumara, Komara is Kumara modern day Kumara. Gundu is actually Gudda. So that which was you know, Kumarana Gudda is, was Komaran Gundu, which has become Kora Mangla over a period of time. That's one version, that's one thought. Historians and epigraphs have about this. The second one is same Kora Mangla, the Kumara uh, is, becomes Kumara or Kora. Kumara becomes Kora. And Mangala is actually a Brahmin settlement that is commonly used in most other places as well. So it's um, possible that you know this is how it has been derived. Most of the others are pretty straightforward. There's no, no not so much of a fighting there. Igluri, Blur, Elkunte, Elkunte, Kudlu, Kudal. Kudal is actually a confluence. You know, Kudal, Sangamadeva, Kudal, and all that. So the thought is that Kudal, why is that place called Kudal? A little further down from Silk Road is it's the confluence of the northern and the southern uh, trade routes. This is a this is a primarily an east-west, north-south trade route uh, in a intersection, if you the by region of Bangalore itself. And Kudalu was considered to be the intersection point for that. Okay. So um, yeah. Um, now from there, we'll move to Madiwala. And um, again, a you know, walking distance from uh, Kormangla today. Very historic place. And just like the Begur temple, in Madiwala is there is something called the Someshwara uh, Devasthana or the Someshwara, Madiwala Someshwara temple. From the outside, it looks pretty um, ordinary, bland. Uh, but the temple inside, is magnificent in terms of the information that's over there in the form of inscriptions there. And uh, now what you're seeing here, 
are two friends, uh, P. V. Venkatesh, Venkatesh and Perumal, and Kingsley. Um, they're they're trying to show to you one inscription there, which is in Tamil, which is from 1366 AD. It's actually a 19 line inscription from top to bottom. It's an amazing inscription uh, in that it's actually a record of a grant of uh, land to uh, a Swamiji uh, who was, there was a Mata which was associated with this temple and there's a Swamiji who had arrived there and who stayed there for a few years. So for his maintenance and for his uh, needs, uh, some land was granted to him. Almost all inscriptions are land grants. Majority of these inscriptions are land grants. When you say land grant, it is not the land is gifted, but the uh, tax, the property tax or the tax from the land is diverted uh, from the king to the temple or to the Swamiji or to the priest or whoever. It's, an, uh, it's like an ATGG scheme of today, where instead of paying taxes to the government, we pay that amount to a charitable institution and the government of India says, yeah, I forego that because you paid it off to a recognized uh, institution. And uh, what these are, these inscriptions in that way are essentially gazetted notifications of estuaries. So the only person who could say exempt you of tax was a king. And uh, the king would uh, officialize it by writing it on stone because it's supposed to be a permanent record and a public record. So that is why it's written there. And here, uh, in this case, this is, there's a mata which is associated with the temple. And that's why the inscription is on the temple. And extensively, it, it, is, um, you know, it details out all the pieces of land and all the types of taxes that, have, that, that, could have, that would have been paid to the king is now to be paid to this mata. When I say types of taxes, it's just like we have uh, you know, various kinds. We had until very recently, you know, before GST came in, a variety of taxes. Tax on petrol, tax on garment, tax on this and tax on that and all of that. So there then they call it out and say these types of taxes, which amount to X amount, which X, uh, you know, X rupees or what was the equivalent of those days, is to be given to this mata. And this grant is for perpetuity for uh, as long as the sun and moon shine you know, this money is to be there that's what it says and the beauty of it is that it names places it names individuals that's how we we know these places exist and that's the significance of these places as well this is another one of in the same temple an inscription from 1301 it runs on the basement here as you see it's called adishtana it's tamil language However, it's from the Hoysala period. This is from the time of Veerabhadala the third. And the way I like to describe this is, this is you know, in keeping with the times today, it's probably one of the most secular inscriptions. In the sense, um, today, uh, you know, like we have various religious denominations, we have Hindus, Christians, Muslims, and all of those. In those days, there were slightly different you know, thoughts around that. So when somebody donates land and you say, okay, all the land between, let's say, Kormangla and Begur, that's a lot of land. The tax from this land is to be given to this temple. Let's say that's what the inscription says. However, there will be certain exclusions. So they'll say, okay, in this region, except for the tax that has already been you know, going, diverted elsewhere, or revenue from, in this case, they say Shiva temples. There's a term for exclusively for that, for Shiva Vishnu temples. So there was a different term, tax term used for Vishnu temples, for Shiva temples, for Jains, for Buddhists. So they explicitly call it out here and say all the land between, in, in bounded in these, uh, by these extents, except for taxes collectible from temples, uh, Moss, I'm sorry, temples, Jain, uh, Basdis, and Buddhists. So in that sense, this is so secular. This is a secular inscription because the exemptions are granted on the basis of religion. Also indicates something, unlike we, you know, unlike um, some of us believe, all things were not glorious. There were differences you know, during those times too. 
and they were dealt with differently. Okay. Now, uh, this is another inscription within the same temple. It's a fantastic and an extraordinary temple. Uh, it's on a niche there by the Ganesha temple, by the idol there. And I'm circling out the inscription here. This is from 1365, and it's for the same Swamiji. And what it mentions is that um, you know, the temple was a Someshwara temple in Tamarai Kere. What we think of as Madiwala today was a later day development. There was no Madiwala in the in, in around this time, 1365. The whole region was called Tamarai Kere or Tamarai Kere, Tamarai Kere being in Tamil, you know, the, the lake with lotus. So Tamarai Kere, the BTM, you know, the T there is Tamarai Kere, and we know it is of at least 1365 antiquity. And the district, the taluk that it was a part of was Vepur or Begur. If you want to think about it in that way. Begur Nadu itself was in, was in a state, if you want to think of, called Rajendra Sola Vela Nadu in Nigarili Sola Mandalam. So these were all the administrative divisions of that time. But an interesting point you'll see is, you know, it's referring to the Cholas and all that, but this is a Hoysala period inscription. It doesn't mean anything at all, except that the administrative names and terminologies were carried forward as well. What's extraordinary about this is the witness to this grant. And when we make a deed today, there has to be witness signatories, right? Is Hariyappa, the founder of the Vijayanagar Empire. Now, everybody goes, you know, who are, when you say Bukraya, Hariyappa, Vijayanagar Empire, Karnataka Empire, and all that, but walking distance of Kormangla is a record of Hariyappa himself having visited that temple and been a witness to a grant in that temple. Now, that's fairly historic if you ask me. One of the most glorious dynasties in southern India is the Vijayanagar Empire. The founder of that visited a place, uh, you know, the, the Madiwala Someshwara temple there, and he signed, signed off a deed himself. It's extraordinarily rare for a king to be witness to a deed of this nature. This is one of those very few ones. And I would say this is one of the must-see places if you are in that region. So this is a probability right behind the probability on the wall is that inscription. OK, all right. So we'll move on. This is one of, I would say, the best kept secrets of Bangalore. Second best secret, best kept secret of Bangalore. Uh, PV, the man sitting now kneeling down on the floor, is trying to point uh, at something written on the basement there. This is again Tamil. It is from 1248. So please remember that. That's 1248. What is written there and what he's trying to show to those people there is essentially what is shown here. If you can read a little bit of Tamil, you should be able to read what's on the stone, highlighted with blue chalk. It is Vengalu. You know, uh, in, in Canada as well, I would have spelled it out so that you can read it. That inscription was made on 3rd March 1248 AD. We know this date so explicitly because the start of the inscription, it says this inscription was written on this day, this Samatsara, this Masa, this, that, and all of that. And that's how when we convert it, we know it to be from 3rd March 1248. And the word there is Vengalur. And what the inscription says is that some lands are by the lake of Vengalur. I'm using, please look at the cursor that I'm showing here. Some lands below the big tank of Vengalur were gifted for the god, you know, Assembly Swaran, Someshwaran, whatever, at that time, in that thing. So what this is telling us is Bengaluru, which be, the bha becomes bha in Tamil. Examples of that are Beral, Beralu in Kannada, Veral in Tamil. So typically, you know, many times this, these, these alphabets, these characters change. So it's hard for a Tamilian to say Bengaluru, he'll say Bengaluru. And that's what's been written out over there as well. So what this is testimony to is that there was a Bengaluru in 1248 AD, much before most people think this city was founded. It's absolutely false. And you're looking at it right now. 
you can go down to that temple yourself. You can look at this. Uh, you can trace out these characters. You can read it for yourself. It's well documented. All this is uh, and published 115 years ago in 1905. This is the text of that inscription in English. And again, you know, there's not much here except that it says certain lands are being granted to the, uh, you know, Matadipati there. Okay. So that's another play must see you know, thing for you if you are in Kaur Mangla. A few other things. Let's see. Let's see about Agara. What's happened in Agara? We all know the Agara Lake there, right? So, um, how old is that lake? So very, very good question. There used to be an inscription there by the land or to the west of the outlet. Unfortunately, this inscription is missing, missing either during the construction of a road or you know, building or building something over there. Uh, that inscription stone has been destroyed. OK, so in this, uh, thanks to this, this is the same. This is commissioned by the same man, uh, Nagatara, that we saw in the earlier um, uh, Virgalu, this that Virgalu that's now in the museum was commissioned in his honor. During his time, uh, somebody is actually fixed sluices, sluice gates to the two tanks, and had an eastern tank built. Now think about the locations here, the two tanks that we are talking about, and this inferred from other sources as well, not just this one thing. We have the Agara Lake and the Belandur Lake, were very much there and were being used in 870 AD. And somebody who is the Iru Alu Rodia, that's the Iglu Rodia, Iblu Rodia, he had two sluice gates fixed for this. You need sluice gates because they grow paddy or whatever, water needs to be left out. And the easternmost tank in uh, Mudana, they call it in Canada here for directions there, on line seven, if you can read it, you can see as Mudana Kereyam, Kattisi. Mudana Kereya is actually the Iblur Lake, and as you climb up the flyover and you turn to the left behind it, there's a small tank. Uh, would have been significant of those days, and those are the three three tanks that we know about. It. So thanks to this, we know that the three lakes there, Agara, Belandur, and Iblur lakes, have been around from at least 870 AD. The key word is 870, at least because we don't have documentary evidence before this. Okay. Unfortunately, we can't see the uh, this one stone because it's destroyed. However, and I'll rush through this. Um, I think we're running short of time. There's one more inscription from Agara, which currently is in uh, the museum. So you can see that. And again, Agara is a place name that's not used um, until at least the 16th century. So the place did not exist by that name or did not exist at all. It seems to be that, you know, Iblur was the name that was was a place that was common there, and these inscriptions all refer to Iblur there. Okay, um, so we'll move on. Now, coming to adjoining the uh, ward of Jaksandra, very interesting one. Uh, a, there used to be an inscription, unfortunately, it's lost uh, by the temple there, which is the Gopal Swami temple, very much there, but the inscription is lost. Uh, what it mentions is it's from 1495 and it says Jakkasandra. This is critical and you know, important to understand. The Sandra is a corruption, whether it's in Jakka Sandra, Channa Sandra, Bomma Sandra, Allal Sandra, all the Sandras are a corruption for Samudra. And the Samudra was actually a exaggerated way of saying a lake. So Jakka, the lake of Jakka, you know, the Samudra of Jakka. And that's important for Kormangla as well. So what happened to this Jakka Sandra? Today we don't have a Jakka Sandra lake. That lake, if you if you go look at the old maps, in 1905 it was there. That is the lake that is behind the shopping complex, BDA shopping complex today. That goes by the name of the Veera Yoda Park. Probably a lot of you would be walking over there as well. The Samudra of Jakka uh, at that then was essentially is become a park today. Okay. And this lake is at least, uh, at, at least, please remember the keyword is 1495. So we're talking about about 600 years, 400 to 600 years here. Okay. And um, one of the better known and a lot of you know, stories around this place, this sama there's one Samadhi in Kaur Mangla. And this is that Samadhi. And this is not 
something that I would consider as very significant. This is supposed to be the Samadhi of uh, the daughter-in-law of Kempegoda. And uh, she is supposed to have committed suicide there um, you know, when um, the fort walls or the fort door would not stand. And it was told that you know, a pregnant woman would have to be sacrificed and she chose to do it herself or something like that, a variation, many variations of these. Uh, this is folklore. This is not historically substantiated. And um, there is no evidence to this effect. In fact, some people quote this, what you're seeing here on the black stone, as an inscription, which is testimony to all of this, which is really not true. Uh, because the, unlike the inscriptions that I showed you uh, earlier, this is a very modern day writing on uh, polished granite. In fact, it's from 1971. It's not from any uh, old period. There's no originality to it. There's no authenticity to it. It's folklore. However, folklore does not mean it's um, false. It only means that it may be true. It may be false. OK, now, so far, if you have seen, all the things that I showed you are factual. So Kaur Mangla's claim to fame is a lot more than just this. Rather unfortunate that people associate this with Kaur Mangla and not the rest. OK, and moving on. So the larger story of Bangalore, and I'll rush through this. Um, so how old is Bangalore itself? We saw one instance from 1248 there in Tamil. The first one and the oldest uh, mention of Bengaluru is in the same Begur Nageshwara temple. And what is highlighted here in pink is Bengalura. It says Nagatara's son and adopted son died in the Bengalur battle. This one is, to be, is, supposed, is from 890 AD. So the first mention of Begur, uh, Be Bengalur is in Begur. So we know that there was a Bangalore in 890-80. Now it's housed in a very nice um, shelter, a Jesse Bo, put up on a pedestal and there's boards explaining the story of this. This was discovered in 1915 by the head of the Mysore State Archaeological Department, a person by name R. Nasimachar, who published an article and said we can discard this theory that Veerabhalala you know, went hunting and found uh, an old lady and she gave him some uh, Bindakalu and all of that. Because in 890 AD, which is about three, 400 years before Veera Ballala, uh, you know, itself we have a mention of Bangalore. However, uh, he said it in 1915, uh, many of us still tend to think that Bengaluru is derived from Bindakaluru and all that stuff. So this is, um, See the first evidence of you know, in a historical sense of an existence of Bengaluru. The second one is what we saw before in the Madiwala temple, and this is in Tamil. And over here we have Bengaluru, and that's from 1247. These are not just the two; we also have other sources. We have something in, in a copper plate inscription from 1434. We have the mention of Bengaluru in that. And we have a literary reference in Telugu called Shiva Tattva Chintamani by Lakkana Gandesha from 1450 AD. There's a Bengaluru mentioned in that. And similarly, you know, another thing. But what I would also want you to see is please remember all of these now, these five mentions predate um, 1537 when supposedly the city was founded. So much before the city was supposedly founded, it existed. And we have evidences to this effect. What's also very interesting is the first three mentions or the first four mentions are in three different languages. We have it in Kannada, Tamil, and Telugu, which also is one of the reasons why this place is so multilingual too, because the use of three languages is not new here, it goes back a long time here. So multilingualism, cosmopolitan um, you know, attitudes are not new because it's been around for so long, okay? Now, obviously, the question is, and a lot of you are probably not from Koromangla, so the question is going to be, okay, so how old is my locality? And my locality could be anywhere. It could be Basangudi, Malaysia, it could be Jayanagar, it could be Indranagar or whatever. And this map 
is a, is developed to answer that question. It's color coded. What you saw there are the same. These are the villages. Villages morphed into wards and you know, a corporation wards. These are the villages. And the first mention of those village in, by name in an inscription is depicted here. So we start from 500 to 700 AD, and then we stop around 1600 AD when the city was supposedly founded. So all these areas that you're seeing here are essentially places that are pre 16th century. Okay, the oldest is Begur. It finds a place in the 517 AD. So the, the locality of Begur today, uh, which is um, actually locked down completely, I believe, is um, at least 1500 years old, and its name was Bempur, Begur, Begur, and variations of that. So you can see most of the city here is pretty old. So the question to ask is when somebody asks how old is Bengaluru, and I would ask you, so which part of Bangalore are you talking about? And if I'm from Begur, which is in Bangalore, I will say my locality is 1500 years old. And you know, depending on where I am, do that. And this is not really you know any uh, secret. All of this is gathered from historical documentation, published, peer reviewed, all of that. Okay. Um, so you can see this online too. It's available freely. Anybody can look it up, can study this. Um, you know, you, you can either scan this QR code, like your bigger version of that, or type this and say, which is, you know, bit, bit .ly slash inscription Bangalore, and it'll take you to Google Maps. There's a Google Maps of the you know, developed uh, map. The icons that you see here, the green, the red, and the ha, uh, another pink or the question mark, these indicate inscriptions in those locations. 153 inscriptions in the city of Bangalore. What it shows you is the status of those. The green heart means it's very much there, you know, it's safe and secure. The red you know, skull means it's been destroyed, gone. And the question mark means we don't know the status of it. It may be there, it's possibly destroyed as well. Okay. Um, so what you can do is you can use this map, the online version of it. You can go to each one of these places, look it up, read the text of the inscription on the Google map itself, see photographs of that, see videos of that, and learn about the story of the city. And this is the QR code that I was talking about. Search for it online and you will get it as well. Now, this is a word, this is a word cloud of the same thing that I spoke about. How old is your locality answered differently? Color coded and by the mention of that locality by the year. So as I said, Begur is from 517 AD. The other end of the city, Dodbidr Kalupinia, is from 750 AD. Hebbard is from 750 AD. Name the locality you can think of. And you know, I would say you'll find something close by there. Maybe in the same name. People may think of HSR as a modern day layout. Buried within HSR is Yalkunte, which is from 980. We spoke about Srinivagilu and Ejipura you know, already there. So Domlur is from 1180. All these localities are pre 16th century localities. Okay. So this is also being recorded. Uh, you can look at the look at this leisurely later on. And the story of lakes is no different. The lakes that you know you often hear about and people view over. Oh, you know, Sampangi Kere is lost. Oh, you know, Dharmambudi is lost. Oh, you know, something else is lost. Guess what? There's only four or five that have been lost. And what I'm showing you here are 43 lakes of the city, far older than these lakes that you think have been lost. These are first mentions, so probably the lake is even older. Hebar Lake is from 880. Next time you go over that flyover and look left, think about it. What you're staring down at is a lake that's 1,200 years old. Why is this important? Bangalore does not have water sources other than lakes. Until we had pipe water supply, people had to draw water from these lakes for cultivation, for drinking. If Bangalore has come about to whatever it is today as a global capital of this world, of the world, these lakes have played a significant role for that. So as Bangaloreans, we owe it you know, to respect, to admire and express our gratitude for these lakes. There's more to the story of the city than just the few lakes that you know you often hear. And these are in every corner of the city that you can think about. 
there's a lake there's a, there's a lake in uh, Dom, there was a lake in Dombur. a couple of lakes in this list are missing there's a lake in uh, you know the Patandur lake still there the Habar lakes there the Iblur lakes there the Begur lakes there the Binnamangla lake is still there except people don't realize it this is inside the army campus opposite the Ingranagar bus depot uh, Jakur Lake is there. All of, most of all of these lakes, except for two in this list, are not there today. All of these, by the way, are pre-16th century lakes. Okay. And going back to the same question, so how old is Bangalore? We answered the question about how old is Bangalore by the name Bengaluru. There's more to the city than just the name. We know people have lived here from prehistoric times. When I say here, I'm talking about the modern day limits of Bengaluru in Hoskere Halli and in Dodkaneli on Sajapur Road. We found rock art, you know, in um, prehistoric times, approximately about 500 BC here, not datable very accurately, but about two and a half thousand, three thousand years ago, somebody living in these places carved out these figures on stone left evidence that this place was habited then. You don't have to go to far off places in Madhya Pradesh or somebody else to see this. We have evidence of this in this city, which is one of the most happening cities in the world. So where are we, what has happened to these? This is what has happened to this. Unfortunately, because of our lack of awareness and apathy, indifference, we destroyed them. So the Oscar early uh, rock, was quarried out. Now what you see is a pit there. This is, where is this? This is um, right by the nice road, the um, PS College toll gate on your right side. The Dotkaneli boulder, there's a man pulling a bull here, a horse or a cow, is now blasted out. 10 years ago, it was blasted by dynamite to build a school. They didn't build anything, anything at all, but it's become a garbage dump. That's how much we care for our past. And not just that, we had, a lot of, we had a lot of other evidences, which unfortunately we don't have photographs of. So we had to rely on photographs elsewhere. You know, the famous menhirs, dolmens, people go all the way to Stonehenge to see very much there. This one is in, near Devnali. You can go see it today too. Um, burial pits. Yeah, we, have, we had burial pits like this in a whole lot of places. GKVK campus, Belandur, walking distance from Kormangla, Kaneli, Jalan, Jalali, Haggadur, which is near Whitefield, Ragi Buddha, Gatigere, all of these places. All of them have been destroyed, built over, but we have, our, we have evidences in terms of published papers, research papers, all of that, which say that these existed 100 years ago. Okay, and, and then the world is flocking to Bangalore today, right? If anyone from Whitefield and ITPL, if you're walking around, you tend to see a lot of Caucasians, you know, you see a lot of Americans, Europeans, Japanese, South Koreans, all of these people. It's not that the world flocked to Bangalore today. Roman coin hoards from the times of Caesar, you know, which is, I would say, between 60 BC and 30 AD, have been found in three locations here. One of them, which is very close to Kormangla, when they were building the HAL uh, runway there, they found a pot full of Roman coins there. There's one near Eshampur that's been found. And there's another hoard that was found at um, the old race course. So obviously you don't find Roman coins in substantial numbers in a location if there were no trade with Romans there. So trade with intercontinental trade has also happened here 2000 years ago. And that's something to be proud of as well. Okay, and uh, so you heard me a few times saying, you know, we lost it, we destroyed it, and all that. And you also heard Badri say we have do a lot of conservation work, and the uh, this is an example of the, uh, I would say the best example of the conservation work we did. And when I say we, uh, all this has been happening in the last three years. Uh, we started around June 2017, and in two months will be three years you know, in terms of the project the efforts. So what you're seeing is something in Hebar, like I showed you in Srinivagilu, this is actually a Viragalu, sitting in a roadside ditch. Uh, this is a photograph from 2017. It's sitting in a roadside ditch and nobody recognized for what it was. And the six months from then, in May 2018, elections came about. As always, 
selection time, road repair work is undertaken, potholes are filled up, road is repaired, etc. So in that dish, they put up, put in jelly. They were going to white top this whole thing. But what happened was when they dug it out, these boys are from a group called Revival Hub Heritage around JP Nagar. So they went all the way to Hebbal and um, you know, they dug the stones out. When they dug it out, this portion of it was under the earth. When it was exposed, they saw writing there. It's an inscription. 750 AD, it mentions Hebbal in a slightly modified way, the parabolal model from that. So this is currently the oldest known writing in the city of Bangalore. Think about it. The city is famous for its educated citizens. It's not that we make saris here, we make jewelry here, we make paintings here. We do any of those kind of things. We don't have world fame. We don't have temples. We don't have mosques. We don't have anything which attracts people. People come here and people live here because of because they're educated. And this is the oldest writing in the city of Bangalore. Okay. We thought, and it's very unlikely we'll find one more of this in the city. So we thought it should not be in a ditch. It should not be you know, lying unrecognized in such a place. And we dis we thought we'll build a mantapa of this, mantapa in the Ganga style. It's the same style as the Begur temple. The entire project is by volunteers. We all do it um, you know, because we like it and we care for the city. So this was uh, this was designed by a lady architect, Eshashwini Sharma, who specializes in temple architecture. And uh, we crowdfunded this. Uh, the entire project was funded by about 400 people and six corporates, Bangalore, Bangalore origin, whatever. And that has been realized today. And what you see in Hebal today, if you go there, whenever the lockdown, lockdowns lifted, is this magnificent structure. Truly, um, you know, a house worthy of an inscription which mentions the name of that locality 1300 years ago. And the first uh, evidence of literate citizens in this city we have of Bengaluru, modern day Bengaluru. Okay, and all of this is thanks uh, to one person by name Benjamin Lewis Rice, B. Lewis Rice. He documented all these inscriptions in 1905 in a book called Epigraphia Karnataka and volume, it was a 12 volume set, volume nine of it was Bangalore Dispute. And the, all we have done, the friends here is gone and, and located these inscriptions, see what it says, map it back to modern day and how is it relevant to Bengaluru, conserve it, uh, put it up in pedestals, put it up in mantpas and most importantly, create more awareness about this. And unless people know about it, they would not know about it, they would not celebrate it, they would not cherish it. And that's that's what our project Inscription Stones of Bangalore is all about. Okay, so um, that was what I wanted to talk. In summary, uh, covered in the last, I would say, 50 minutes maybe, are these few things. I spoke about the history of Srinivagilu, uh, backyard of Tormangla, two kilometers from the video shopping complex, having a history dating back to the 8th century. We spoke about Kormangla itself uh, from 9th century. Tavare Kere extensively, we spent a lot of time there. The Madiwala Someshwara Temple is what's Tavare Kere there. Uh, we spoke about the inscriptions there, the names of the places, Begur, Tavare Kere, all of those mentions that are mentioned. And Agara, Jaksandra, Begur, and lastly, I also covered a little bit about Bengaluru or Bengaluru. So, uh, you know, in this um, 15 minutes, quite short you know typically you can easily talk about one of this for days or hours try to cover the um, three kilometer vicinity of bda shopping complex and the 1200 year stories of these okay and uh, that's really what i had to uh, tell how do you find out more how do you stay in touch with us uh, we are fairly active on social media facebook um, Facebook, you know, we have a group called Inscription Stones of Bangalore. A lot of information is shared by a lot of people there. Some, a lot of it is Bangalore, some of it is not, but that's our primary point for discussions, disseminating information. We are also on Twitter, Inscription BLR. Please follow us over there. Um, if you also want to reach out to me directly, uh, and it's pretty easy, my, you don't have to remember this. You can also Google, you'll get all the information you want. Um, the story that I told you is um, for Kormangla is a story, a similar story exists for every single locality region of the city. So there's um, 
there's this kind of stories you can talk about for Indra Nagar, you can talk about for Maleshwaram, you can talk about for Vijayanagar, you can talk about for Basangudi, and the collective story of uh, collect the collective stories of all these places is really the story of the city. And what is extraordinary for me and for everyone here, it should be, is that there is, to the best of to my best of knowledge, and I've checked with you know, every historian epigraphist that is around, there is no city in the world uh, where we can give such an extraordinary um, story. Evidence, documented uh, information is not available. And when I'm saying this, I'm talking about places like Rome, Cairo, Beijing, name the place, supposed to be historic across the world or within our country. People tend to think that, you know, Delhi, Bombay, Madras, Calcutta, whatever, you know, most of these other places are older and have a richer past to claim to than Bangalore. Uh, but I don't think so. And I hope the last 45 minutes, 50 minutes should have revealed to you that we have a richer story, evidenceable story, a story worth celebrating and cherishing as well. Okay, so I'll stop here and um, you can take questions um, as we go. Wow, Uday. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, uh, I did not imagine that we would be so gripped. Uh, you know, accolades are pouring in on the chat. Thank you so much, Uday. Uh, before we go to questions, uh, I, I had, uh, you know, I had an easy kind of small thank you speech uh, ready, but uh, you know, you know, you made it so difficult to uh, say that, uh, say anything typical. So here's what I learned from you, and I'll say that to you now. Uh, I was trying. To, oh, can you guys see my screen? I don't seem to be able to make it full screen. Well, let, let me see if I can make this uh, slideshow kind of thing. Uh, I. I Bear with me. I mean, I thought this was very apt to share. Yeah, okay, here we go. You guys see it? <laughs> yes, I can. Go. I don't know. We can't see, but I can hear you. Oh, I see. Okay, I, I'm. I'm very happy to know about our Korumangla. When we came here almost about 40 years ago. Uh, we used to make fun of it as Kosumangala because there used to be a lot of uh, mosquitoes only. You open your mouth in the evening, only mosquitoes will get in. So we used to make fun, my friends, that you have gone to Kosumangala. Then, then we had, uh, my God, the monkeys. It was crazy, man. It was coming into our houses, coming into our gardens and shifting our uh, clothesline and uh, you know used to do antics on our lawn and used to have a big picnic party on our lawn because it would come inside the houses so it was now we are, we are, my friends used to make fun of it as Koti Mangala then eventually it became Kora Mangala because uh, they said okay a lot of Koras have come to Kora Mangala so, so because it was not just old world Bangaloreans uh, I know I don't mean to I mean hurt anybody's feelings but they said, okay, Korum Mangala, I don't know how the uh, BDR, BBMP also who formed the layout. Uh, now we got the uh, this thing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Uday. We know now how the name from Bendakaluru became Bengaluru, Bengaluru. Uh, Vya mm. and Ba, yeah, Tamil and uh, Kannada. Yeah, it is very, very interesting. Uh, so we were so happy to know the history. Though I was born here 75 years ago, so I didn't know all this history. Thank you very much for your time. It was very interesting. I've noted down your mobile and your uh, Facebook page. I would like to invite you for a senior citizen chapter we have of uh, Bangalore, Code Mangla, of seniors. I would really appreciate if you could find time and effort to come and present a PPT. Let all this COVID behind us. And I think come June or September, come September maybe, I think we seniors will be allowed to go out. And we would love to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just add one thing, though. Uh, this is my first ever uh, webinar. I do not do this, though, as a, this is how I earned my salary for 30 years, uh, because this is not something you see through slides. 
within uh, distance of your place is the Madiwala temple. Let's go there. Even if your senior citizens yeah. will make it. Yeah? yeah. Uh, unless we go see the place, we identify with that, we touch it, we feel it, uh, it's not going to sink in. Let me give you an example for this. Um, the Srinivagilu inscription that I showed you from 750 AD, right? Think about this. The earliest known available literary work for us in Kannada today is Kavi Raja Marga, which is about 150 years after that. So if you want to remember, you want to know how Ruputanga wrote Kavi Raja Marga in what shape, form, characters, it's there, two kilometers from Kormangla. You can go see it. You can touch it. You can feel it. That's how you need to experience this and not by slides. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Uday. And uh, also, famously, Uday conducts these walks. Uh, one of the popular ones that's always overbooked is the Madiwala walk and so on and so forth. So we'll stay in touch. And uh, and uh, also, Uday, make sure there are uh, many more uh, enthusiasts like you groomed so that each of us can uh, experience this in our own humble way. And uh, Thank you, everybody. Thanks for taking time time this evening and joining here. Of course, all credit because all credit to Uday because everybody knows. A lot of you know how what he brings to the table. So have a great evening, Uday. Thanks for making us so proud about. I also table. wanted to know: Do you conduct walks? Yes. Like how my friend Vijay goes for the uh, you know trees walk and all. He takes heritage walks and all that. Do you also conduct if we request you? Some walks yes. around these. Yes, we do. Uh, we do walks um, um, once or twice a month in a different part of Bangalore uh, every month. So we have done walks okay. in Kadgodi, in Gomlur, in Hebal, in Begur, in Madiwala, at the museum, in Maleshwaram. We pick a different area uh, each month, each time, so that you know that portion of the city gets highlighted. Residents there get a chance to learn about it. I'm very happy to do yes. it. Let me know when you want to do it. And it will be done. Yeah. So does it happen on Sunday mornings generally? How do you? Yeah, it's usually on a holiday. Uh, uh, if there's a public holiday yeah. or a Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Hello. Uh, hi, Uday. This is Maharish. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, Uday. Uh, so I had this question about the Madiwala temple you're talking about. You mentioned that the Hariyappa mentioned there is the founder of the Vijayanaga dynasty. Is there any other way to, I mean, exactly know that the Sariyara one? Yes. Uh, because um, this is what Uh, sorry, Uday, Uday, sorry, we lost you for a minute there. Okay, somebody's muting me, I think. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm not about that. Yeah. Yeah, so um, Amavrish, what it's uh, it's pretty easy to deduce this uh, because the lineage is given there. It says uh, Bukhraya's son, uh, his son, who was at that time in Mulbagal and all that. So when we put the pieces like this, it's not just in this one inscription, but from other inscriptions as well, and collectively see them. We know for sure it was Arya Paraya, the founder. Oh, thanks. That's, that's very interesting because there's a lot of questions about uh, where the Haryar and Bukharaya came from. There's this theory that he was uh, with the Mughal emperors. Uh, no, this does not answer that. All it tells yeah. you is that Arya Paraya visited the Madiwala Sumeshwara temple and he was a witness to that grant. So you know, please don't infer any more than that. Uh, just that you know, you can go there, see that, see, feel it, and say, okay, uh, this is this is a place where Arya Praya was. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Bye. I need to go to the segregation meeting now. That's going on side by sure. side. Thank sure. you. <laughs> Any other questions, please? Right. Questions? Yeah. Uh, Hello. Yes. I yeah, I would to, like to say to I'm thankful for Badri Narayan for inviting uh, all the Rotarians and I I enjoyed your session. It's really very informative. We must know who we are and what we are and our location. 
I'm thankful to Badri for inviting me as well as Mr. Uday Kumar. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, and I would like to be part of your group in future and even Heritage Walk and other things. I would like to just simply thank you this evening for the wonderful time that we have spent together and your interest. I would like you to encourage you, please do much more because many of us, we do not care for what is available uh, in our places and we destroy, we just try to, you know, uh, cover it up. So uh, I'm thankful for your, uh, for your uh, effort in this matter and your group, all those people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank Badri. You. I, I would like to thank uh, Uday Kumar and uh, Badri for uh, the webinar. I think it was very fascinating. Uh, kudos to both of you. Great. So if you have any questions, we'll take them. Uh, <laughs> I think we are um, pretty late otherwise. Any more questions? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi, this is Varsha um, and I'm an urban uh, researcher and an urban ecologist who's been working on uh, slender lorises in Bangalore. So we do a lot of oral history. Um, we try to gather a lot of oral history about wild animals in the city. So when you are uh, working with these inscription stones, have you ever come across any mention of a wild animal and an encounter with a wild animal in Bangalore or anywhere around Bangalore? Oh, yeah. Um, so um, one category of memorial stones are called Huli Bete Viragallus. <clears throat> Huli uh, is a tiger. And uh, somebody who died um, fighting a tiger is, um, you know, is, 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 is actually a memorial stone is commissioned for him. And um, we have three of these in the city. And very interestingly, one of this is very close to uh, Kormangla in Madiwala, close to the okay. Madiwala temple. Um, the first, that one is um, from the 13th century. It's uh, opposite the BTM bus stand uh, and on the main road there. Uh, not so easy to find. It looks like one of the regular roadside um, temples. It's housed there, the Holy Beta Virgalu. That's from the Hoysala period. Uh, we have one uh, in Bangalore University campus, which is from the 7th century. Um, that is the second one. And the third one in IIC campus, uh, which is actually from the 10th century as well. So we have three uh, records of the tiger being in um, the current bounds of Bangalore city and people having died uh, fighting the tiger. They could have been fighting it for two reasons. One is uh, may have been um, a man eater, it may have been eating cattle, it may have been stealing whatever livestock, they may have hunted it down. Uh, two is it could have been hunted down itself. And people may have hunted it down for fun or whatever as well. So these are holy better variables. We have three of those in the city. Uh, we also have uh, another category called Handi Bete, which is wild boar. Okay. Uh, boar, is, boar is also good meat, right? So uh, similarly, when they were either fighting, uh, hunting it down, or they were attacked by a wild boar and they died, uh, those are found. Uh, one of them was uh, is in Alal Sandra. That's a mention of that there. Alal Sandra is uh, near Elanka. Okay. Um, then Turugolu, what we saw just now, and Srinivagilu, those are cattle, right? Domesticated, domesticated cattle. These are three common animal references that you find in uh, Bangalore city. However, that's not the only, there are others as well. Sometimes a pet dog dies. Uh, then that's for the nai, you know, nai beta virgalu as well. So those are also, uh, there's one in the museum, though it's not Bangalore proper, there's one sitting in Bangalore Museum, which is for, um, Heroic dog. Dogs were used. So that's also there. And um, these are the things that I can think of right away. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. That was really interesting. And it's very interesting to also note how dogs are also included in inscription stones because now we just consider them to be you know, household pets and maybe not in the uh, status of a tiger. But it's really fascinating how they are also included. Yeah, so um, there are three of them in the city, wherever native location, it's a Bangalore University has been from somewhere close by. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. So it was a really great talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions?
Okay. Yeah, this is Sedu again. Uh, I would like to ask a question regarding there was a name mentioned as Udayar uh, in uh, in Madiwala Temple inscription, and again some other one of our inscriptions said about it because yeah. there is a reference in Tanjur Temple in Tamil Nadu where the yeah. Udayar was a king at that time. Or is the is it the Udayar Mysore Udayar? Is there any research anything that you are able to connect uh, connect sir? Yeah, no, there's two things. There are two different things. Uh, Udayar is God. You know, any any God, um, it could be um, generally any God is referred to as Udayar in the Tamil inscriptions. Uh, so in Bumlur, they would say Chokanatha Perumal or Chekunatha Udayar or whoever, somebody like that. Tamare Kere, Sembi Suran Udayar. So, um, you know, there's one in Kacharekanali where again there is a Udayar there. This is not like a um this is this is just another name for god perumal is think of it as equivalent of a perumal uh, the odaya that you are talking about um is a dynasty now but originally it is also the kannada term for a chieftain leader even today uh, when we speak kannada not the city dwellers you know rustic kannada um, we always say in Odia, Agidia Odia, and all that. That is not a reference to a king, it's a chieftain or an elder or a senior. Uh, in fact, if you saw the Sinivagilu uh, thing there, Yere Appa, Yere, Yere, Yere Appa is actually Odia, is a, is a, is a form of Odia there. Uh, the Odia uh, in Mysore is a dynasty, also derived from you know the same Odia terminology, but now it's now applied to a family or a dynasty. That's all. So there's no connection between the Odia and the Madiwala Someshwara Udayar and the Mysore Odayas, none, or the Madurai or anywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's, we say non Odaya, right, in Kannada. That's the uh, that's essentially the same. And uh, you also use the same word for God as well. Okay. It's actually a mark of respect. You say that Odaya means it's a it may be an elderly person or even a matadipati or even a king of course in earlier times it was referred to what your family in mysore we all know that it is the king dynasty you know majestic dynasty anyway it was lovely for us day a fitting thing about uh, bangor earth coming to know today and uh, it marked the earth day celebrations for me so thank you Oh. Oh, good evening. Uh, my name is Rago. Okay. Okay. I, I, in fact, am amazed by the works which you have done. Now, uh, one small clarification is this Sinivagalu temple. Uh, mm -hmm. We used to go there once upon a time, and later on, the cadets started stopping us and asking, you know, retaining us and detaining us and asking questions. Suppose mm -hmm. in those days, we didn't know there was an inscription which we had to experience that. Now, if we have to go there, uh, uh, how do we reach that place? Because now, uh, uh, all of a sudden, I've seen that you know there is a lot of barricades and we cannot reach that place. No, um, you can go there. Um, at least until a few months back, it was not. Uh, it was open to the public. If you said, "I'm going to go to the Shiva temple," you are allowed uh, because the Sinivagilu villagers still go there and pray. Shivaratri is a very big event. The photographs I was showing you there, actually the Shamyana there was for Shivaratri. Uh, okay. It is open, you can go, but please tell them clearly that you want to go see the Shiva temple and you will not be stopped. Okay, okay. Okay, I think probably at that time, you know, there were some instructions, but now I'll try again. This is the same way I can go through that Ijipura signal. After that, I take a left into that construction area, right? Correct, right. same thing. In, fa in, fact, in fact, one of the photographs I showed had the cadets themselves there. They were very keen to understand yes. what it was. Yeah. <laughs> so they're they very nice. You know, there's no issues. Just tell them you want to see the Shiva temple and uh, be careful you don't wander around there. <laughs> you go straight mm -hmm. to the temple. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thanks for ten uh, day. Yeah. But how do we get permission to go into the defense area? How are they going to allow us, common citizens? You have the right of way there. They won't stop you. That's what I said. If you tell the sentry you want to go to the Shiva temple, you will be allowed it. 
Deve, deve okay. 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 Good. So next Shivratri will go to Shiva temple. Right. Uh, thank you. One more uh, on behalf of everybody. Profil, thanks to Uday. Thanks for keeping us uh, totally riveted uh, with attention. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. And like uh, Madam Mumapai said, Earth Day today. Uh, let's all do our bit for, uh, for the Earth and making it a great place. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, Uday.